Now, that's something I look at and call it senseless, crazy, stupid love. I was told, read of the story, as a matter of fact, in April 2010, a young lady, um, Kelly, learned that the man she was madly in love with was in a relationship with a, 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 a girlfriend as basically a very long-term girlfriend. He was planning to marry the woman, Kelly, uh, was, was the, the ex-girlfriend of this young man. And, and she was so devastated that, that, that her ex-boyfriend, she was hoping they would get back together because she was so in love, madly in love with him. But when she heard of the fact that her ex-friend was planning on marrying someone else, so crushed and devastated she was, she wanted this relationship so bad that she turned to YouTube and posted 62 videos of raw emotions all about her heartbreak and her love for this man. In other words, she embarrassed herself on YouTube in order to let the man know that she loved him. She's madly in love with him. It is said that she actually gained a loyal following of about 11,000 viewers, including her ex-boyfriend, who actually decided at the sight of his depressing girlfriend that he wanted her back. Uh, that's crazy, senseless, so stupid love. <laughs> Usually, in any sensible relationship, notice I use the word sensible relationship, there is mutual love. We love someone who also loves us back. That's the norm, isn't it? Right? We are in love and we are somebody who's falling in love with us too and, and things are going even if it's not at the same time but there is a mutual feeling. Uh, isn't that so? That's a sense of a relationship. If one of your sisters or, or your daughters uh -huh, is in love with a man who doesn't love her, you would tell that girl leave the man alone. I got you with me, wouldn't you? If, if your girlfriend is, is madly in love with a man who does not treat her right, who disrespect her, who, who really doesn't pay any attention to him, what would you say? Leave, Leave him alone, right? Because you'll think that the young woman is foolish, foolish to be uh, chasing after a man who uh, doesn't uh, love her. It, it's crazy to want to be in a relationship with someone who does not love you in return. Unreturned love is one of the saddest of uh, 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 all loving relationships and experiences, rather. To love someone who does not love you is to expose yourself to disrespect and embarrassment or pain and rejection. Who wants to be rejected? Nobody wants to be rejected by anyone. So in order to, 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 to not be rejected, you want to be in love with someone who is also in love with you. Isn't that so? Yes. That's the norm. That's a sensible thing to do, isn't it? In the book of Hosea, we find one of the most compelling love stories of unreturned love. The story is a dramatic picture of a stormy love affair, a broken marriage, a jilted husband, an unfaithful wife, and a relentless lover. The Bible begins, so if you want to turn it, I'm just going to move forward because I know I'm limited with time. But the Bible begins in Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2 reads, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, to Go take to yourself an adulterous wife, an adulterous wife, and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in the parting from the Lord. Now, the first thing you got to note in this particular text, when God spoke to Hosea, it is the kind of woman that God told Hosea to marry. It is expected that the God indeed will tell his servant it's time to marry. But God didn't just tell him it's time to marry. Go get yourself a woman. God is specific in the kind of woman that is a prophet ought to marry. The Bible is clear. God said that. 
imagine God coming to you, one of you ladies. Pastor College. <laughs> Telling you to marry someone who is bent to prostitution. Crazy, isn't it? Why in the world would God command his prophet Hosea to marry a woman who will break his heart? Who will be continually committing adultery in the relationship? The Bible says, Hosea, verse 3, went and took Goma, the daughter of Dibli, and married her. Now, the brother is married to the sister. He knows what kind of woman she is. She's a prostitute. Let's assume that the early stage of their marriage was beautiful. The honeymoon was beautiful. She knows what to do and how to do it. She's experienced. It was beautiful. They had fun. Uh, days went by. The weeks went by. Maybe months. And Hosea really believed that he's doing something to change her because Hosea is very faithful. Are you with me? You see, the word Hosea simply means save. God saves our salvation. So Hosea believes that he's saving her from her predicament and he sees a progress and he believes that something good is happening. But the honeymoon is over and the first child came. His heart must have swelled with joy. You can imagine the proud father. You know, he must have just basked in the glory that he has started a new family with this woman. That his friends told him his marriage would never work. His friends must have told him that this was not going to work. His friends must have discouraged him from marrying Goma because they knew that she was a prostitute. Maybe one of his friends had a relationship with her. I don't know, but maybe his friends told him Possibly, you know, being a prophet, maybe he was an elder in the church. Have mercy, Lord. I know the church didn't like it when their elder, when, 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 when one who is so close to God, or who is supposed to be so close to God, goes out and marry a prostitute. I know they probably voted him out of office. <laughs> so he's happy because he's thinking, all right, I'm going to prove of them wrong. We're starting a family, the first child. He's very excited. Joy is in the home and happiness. They're singing the songs of heaven. The months went by, and as the months move forward, Isaiah is noticing a little change in his wife. He's noticing that she's becoming a little restless. He noticed that she appears a little unhappy. He noticed that she's complaining about things that are not really things to complain about. But being Hosea, the faithful man, he drew closer to Goma. He, he did all that he could to love her. He bought her gifts and he showed her with all the goodness that he could. He cooked a dinner. He made sure there was breakfast. He made sure that her clothes was washed. He made sure, he made sure that the house was clean. He just said, sweetie, I know that you're tired. I know that something is wrong. I don't know what it is, but, but, but maybe you're not feeling so well. Hosea went to work, but then he came home in the evening and he made sure that dinner was made. Are you hearing me? He was faithful to the core. The more he loved her, the more he worked for her, the more he gave her gifts, the more she complained and complained and complained. Soon he noticed that she's staying out in the evenings a little bit later than usual. She's not really working, but she's out later. But Hosea still continued to love her. The Bible tells me in verse 6 of that same chapter that Hogoma became pregnant again and gave a birth this time to a girl. Convinced somehow in his mind that the child was not his because he cannot remember the last time he had relations with his wife. He can't remember the last time he slept with his own wife. So he's convinced that this child could not be his. The timing is kind of off. The child comes and the, 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 the disposition of the child is a little bit different from Hosea. But he said nothing to her. His friends started talking to him, but he does not believe them. You see, he wanted to 
name symbolizes rebellion and brokenness. There is trouble in the marriage. But Hosea, being a faithful man, a faithful husband, Lord, give me such a man that continued to love and care for his wife, hoping that she would change and that things would change. But uh, the, the longer he stayed with her, and as the weeks go by and the months go by, and notice that things only got worse. Ah, finally she gave birth to a third son. And, and this time, this time, he knew that the son was not his. Didn't look like him. Didn't seem like his. He knew that there couldn't be anything. There was no immaculate conception going on here. So he knew that the child was not his. And so the Bible said, he gave the child a name that means not mine now. A child born within his own house does not belong to him. And it was obvious. Oh, that I could pause to say sometimes there are many experiences in our lives that cause us pain. But I believe that one of the most painful of all is the unfaithfulness within a marriage. The unfaithfulness of a marriage partner. You're hearing me today. For Hosea, the pain, that pain was not just something occasioned by a single fall. You know, you just made a mistake, you messed up one time, twice, and, and you start over again. Mm -hmm. For Hosea, his wife practiced on faithfulness as a lifestyle. This was her lifestyle. Her lifestyle was to breathe a prostitute. And somebody listening to me today. That was her lifestyle. She was unfaithful. She didn't know anything else but to be unfaithful. Her first name was unfaithful. Her middle name was unfaithful. Her last name was unfaithful. And if she had another name, it was unfaithful. It didn't matter how you take it. She was Miss Faithful and Mrs. Faithful. However you look at it, it was just simply unfaithful. Mm. No matter what he did, she was unfaithful. No matter what he gave her, she was unfaithful. It didn't matter how much he loved her, she was unfaithful. So unfaithful she was that she had no problem looking straight in Hosea's face and said, I'm leaving you. And she left him with the three children, even the one that she knew and he knew did not belong to him. But Hosea, in all the midst of his faithfulness, still being faithful, still being faithful, still being faithful, he took care of the children. He did whatever it took to make sure that the children were okay. Whatever you do, he still loved deeply, faithfully, unconditionally. Mm. What do you do? What do you do when you love so deeply, so faithfully, giving yourself unconditionally to your husband, but he rejects your love and cheats on you openly and consistently? What do you do when your spouse breaks the marital vows and and, 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 and give birth or it's, um, since you are the ladies and uh, uh, have children out of the marriage that obviously you know you know you, you know about it and your entire community knows about it what do you do do you stay in the marriage do you keep on loving what do you do do you keep uh, taking him back do you keep allowing the man to keep coming back into your house over and over again he flaunts it in your face your community knows uh, uh, that he's sleeping around and he makes no secret about it. He tells you to your face. Uh, you see it as you walk on the street. You know that the man is unfaithful. What do you do? Put yourself there for a moment. You have an unfaithful husband. No matter what you do, how much you show love for him, he consistently cheat on you. You plead with him. You give him chance after chance, hoping that he will change. But the more you love him, the more he disrespects you, but you still want him. Hmm? Isn't that how it is? Is it? I'm serious. Who would put up Dr. Simmons? Seriously. It's 
senseless, crazy, senseless, foolish. Would you put up with that? You're a wise woman. <laughs> no, for real, who would? Who would? Somebody testify, who would? Which of you would? Mercy. Mercy. I gotta pray for you. You left finally. But watch it. Watch it. This is the story of God. Catch the picture. This is God's story. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 31 3, I have loved you. With an everlasting love. With love and kindness have I drawn you to myself. This is the story of God. Are you hearing me today? Which of us in here would put up with what Hosea put up with? Taking her back and treating her right in spite of the fact. Which of us would be like the sister for 10 years? Which of us would? As a matter of fact, there is a story, February 2003, Dr. Clara Harris, you may have heard the news, was sentenced to 20 years in prison, I believe she was from Texas too, I'm not sure, for killing her adulterous husband with her Mercedes Benz in a hotel parking lot after she discovered he was having an affair with his former receptionist. You see, she found out that she followed him and saw it, and she would rather kill him than to let him leave her. Wow. She loved him that much, but she was angry with him. And she decided that she could not have him, but nobody would. And so she ran over him with her Mercedes Benz. Are you hearing me? But, but, but I want you to catch the picture with me today. Hosea was madly in love with Goma. Are you hearing me? And she consistently walked away, had children in the marriage that did not belong to Hosea. But Hosea, 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 even though he did not want her to leave, but, but, but he allowed her to leave without a word of criticism. You see, Hosea did not run her over. Are you hearing me? As a matter of fact, Hosea didn't even tell her to leave. He did not even ask her to leave. He actually didn't even want her to leave. But he loved her enough to let her go. When it was time for her to go, he let her go. She turned her back on him. Yet he continued to long for her. And she, 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 she moved away from him. She turned away from him. She turned her back from him. Uh, to him rather. But, 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 Hosea, somebody need to shout hallelujah. Hosea continued to be faithful to her in spite of her unfaithfulness. He still provided for her. If she needed anything and she came to the house, he still would do it. If she was hungry and she stopped by, he would still provide a dinner for her. If she came by and she said, baby, I don't have any money. Though he knew that she's got all the men, he would still get into his pocket and bless her with whatever as she needed. He provided her. Though she had many lovers and wanted nothing to do with him, Coleman knew she could always depend on him. That senseless, crazy love. Somebody needs to know today that God loves you enough to let you go. Did you hear me? You didn't expect me to say that. Dr. Clara Harris loved him, but not enough to let him go. She killed him. Hosea loved Goma enough to let her go, but still provided, still took care of her. Somebody needs to know this is a story of God. I'm painting a picture here of God and his people, the relationship between God and his people. Are you hearing me today? Don't miss the point of the story. You need to know, somebody here needs to know that God loves 
promise you will not to let you go. You see, God will not run over us. He will not embarrass us. He will not hurt us. He will simply let us go. You want to make a decision to go? Then you can go. He loves me enough to let me go. That's a senseless, crazy love. Love that makes no sense. Love that is unconditional. Love that is without judgment. Love that is without guilt. Love that is without shame. He won't embarrass you. He won't let you feel less than. He loves you in love. No matter how you behave. No matter what you believe. It doesn't matter who you are. God loves you in love to let you go. God's love comes to us. In a crazy kind of way. A relentless kind of way. The God of the universe. The creator of galaxies loves us with a radical love, an unconditional love. He loves us so much that he will let us go. But listen to me now. He loves us enough to let us go, but he loves us too much to leave us alone. So here is God. You walk away from him. Refuse to come to him to surrender yourself fully to him. And in the midst of your mess, God is still protecting you. Yeah. Hmm? Some of you made some decision and get yourself into some things that you know that you should have been six foot under. You know that you should have been in a wheelchair or lying in a hospital somewhere. But look at you looking all good. Hmm. Because his mercy kept you. You promised to love him. You gave him your heart, but you took it back. You gave him your love, but you took it back. And you're walking kind of in and out with him. One foot in the river and one on the back. Are you hearing me? Like Elijah said, you're dancing between two opinions. Sometimes it's God and sometimes it's the devil. One minute you are in Hosea's house and the next minute you're playing the prostitute with another man. What I'm simply saying, one minute you are with God and the next minute you are against him. You are doing things that you know that God asked you not to do. You are living a lifestyle that you know that God is not pleased with. You kind of living a double standard life. Your friends don't know that you're living that life. You come to church and pretend that all is well. But God knows Hosea knows that she's unfaithful. God knows. But it still protects you. Let you go. Didn't embarrass you. Didn't cut you down. Didn't take his blessings. Still provide and still give you life. He did what he did because he loves you. Loves you enough to let you go, but loves you too much to leave you alone. So watch God. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Hosea, Go again. In other words, he did it before. So go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. Hosea said, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half omers of barley. Is there anybody in the house today who knows that love will make you do some crazy, foolish things? <laughs> the woman you married in the first place left you. And you go back looking for her and pay money to get her back. Richard Armstrong reports the story about a man in Wales who sought to win the affection of a certain lady for 42 years. Mm. Apparently, this man and woman were friends, but they had a, a falling out, and she refused to speak to him. For 42 years, the persistent man slipped a weekly, let's see, 
Yeah. The man slipped a weekly love letter under the woman's door. But she continually refused to speak to him. And after writing 2,184 love letters, wow. without ever getting a spoken or written answer, the single-hearted old man eventually summed up the courage to present himself in person 42 years after writing 2,184 love letters without a response. He decided one day, he was going to knock on her door. He knocked on the door of this reluctant lady and asked her to marry him. Mm. To his surprise, she accepted. Wow. For the two years. That's crazy. That's a true story, by the way. Wow. Me? Do that? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> Yet is not, is this not what God? It's been a while since God had left. And God tells the man to go back. After begging her, writing love letters, appealing to her, and she would not. It's been a while. God comes to him and said, go back and bring her home. Any woman sitting here would think that this is simple crazy. He cheats on you. Father, children that are not yours. And maybe I'm touching a card in somebody's heart today. Left you, embarrassed you, rejected your love, openly prostituted himself, Everybody knows it, and you must know or take him back. Not only are you taking him back, you're going to pay him to come back. <laughs> the Bible said Hosea wanted to find his wife. Imagine the scene with me. Watch the prophet. Watch him walking the street in search of his prostituted wife. It's late at night. It's cold outside. The streets are crowded with prostitutes and drunkards and homeless and careless and buyers and sellers. He found himself on the street. He's tired. He's cold. He wanted to go home. But something within him just wouldn't let him give up on going on. He wants her back. No matter how bad the situation was and is. He wants her back. His eyes roam the streets looking for that one familiar face. He can't seem to find her anywhere. He's looking in the face of prostitutes who are lining the street. Catch the picture with me. As he walked, finally his eyes caught a figure in a corner. But he shook his head. It couldn't be. He can't believe what he's looking at. It looks like Goma, but it couldn't be Goma. It just didn't look like her, yet it looks like her. She stood almost naked. He could almost see her ribs protruding through the scarred and bruised skin. Her beautiful long hair, black and beautiful, looked dirty and out of place. Her eyes that once drove men to their knees in adoration now looked empty. Her face was pale and drawn from fatigue and abuse. She steered into the passing cars filled with men who were buying, but no one wanted her. They took one look and they moved forward. No one wanted her, for she was worth nothing. Nothing. Hosea looked at Goma. 
and with tears in his eyes. Pitch faith with me. The Bible tells me in verse 2 of that same chapter 3 that Hosea paid a 15 pieces of silver and one and a half homers of body to buy his own wife back. I can imagine that without a word of condemnation, without a word of making her feeling guilty, he wrapped her, put his coat around her, and he took her home with, with all the love that he could love her. He loved her from that wretched state. He pulled her and he gave her one more chance of recovery. He put his arms around her. There was not a word of condemnation. He never said, see what you got yourself into. He never said, see, I told you you shouldn't have done it. He did not say a word of condemnation. He did not make her feel guilty. All he did was love her with everything he's got inside of her. It didn't matter what she looked like. It was his wife. The story is our story. It is the story of the relationship between God and his people. Hosea's marriage to an adulterous woman is an expression of God's relationship with us who are often caught in adultery between God and the devil. Are you hearing me today? God is madly in love with us, but we are not in love with him. Let's get it real, ladies. Let's be real right now. I thank God for those of you who are madly in love with God and are serving God completely and have surrendered your all to God. But let's get it real. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to be repentant. Are you hearing me? So I didn't come to talk to the righteous. I came to talk to sinners like myself who often find themselves playing a Russian roulette with their eternal destiny, who find themselves dancing between two opinions, who are serving God and the devil at the same time. I came to talk to you. You who are righteous, pray for me while I talk to the unrighteous. Jesus, help me. Mm -hmm. No matter how faithful God is, we are consistently unfaithful to him. We reject his love by our consistent refusal to fully surrender ourselves to him. Let's be real today. We have not come to that place when we have fully surrendered ourselves to the Lord. It's 12.30. Don't look at your time. I told you what time it is. So don't look at it. We make decisions that pull us away from God. We quit on God. We give up on God. We dishonor God. We tell people that we are Christians, yet our friends see no form of Christianity in us. We kind of religious, but we're not spiritual. Get it right today. You have the name of Jesus, but you don't have Jesus in your life. It's time we get it right. But, 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 but the story is not about me today. You see, the story is about God. God won't leave us alone. No matter how much we give up on him, he just can't seem to give up on us. That's why you hear him say in Hosea chapter 11 verse 8, How can I give you up? How can I hand you over? My heart is moving within me. My sympathy is stirred. God can't give us up. Amen. Doesn't want to lose us. He loves us enough to let us go, but loves us too much to leave us alone. With relentless love, he comes after us. You see, I right, remember when Adam and Eve sinned, it was not Adam who turned to God. It was God who went looking for them. It is God who asks, where are you? And it is still God today who is asking us, where are you? Where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you in the condition of your heart when it comes to Jesus? Where are you? That's the question somebody needs to answer today. He comes asking, where are you? Like Hosea. He comes looking for us through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. He sent his son. They called him Jesus. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten 
the Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but uh, should have eternal life. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, like Hosea, Jesus comes to earth uh, looking for us. He walked the road to Calvary, and there he paid uh, the price uh, with his own life in order to buy us back from the auction block of sin. Are you hearing me today? As a matter of fact, I was studying this concept of Hosea paying a, a, a 15 pieces of shekel and one and a half homers of barley. And when, when, when some commentators break it down, I'm just telling you what they say. I don't know how true it is, but they tell me that one and a half homers of barley equals 15 pieces of silver. And if Hosea paid 15 pieces of silver and one and a half homer of barley, which equals 15 pieces of silver, 15 and 15 means it's 30 pieces. Did Judas not betray him? The 30 pieces of silver. Are you listening to me today? The word Hosea means salvation. And the word Goma means to be perfect. Are you hearing what God said? He looked at her at home while she was in her mess and see what she could be. Hallelujah for the Lamb, to the Lamb, to the Lamb, to the Lamb of God. He looked at you in the midst of your mess and see what you could be. And he called you perfect. While you are still prostituting yourself because he sent Jesus to die for you, to shed his blood, that we can be perfect in him. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Mm. As we stand in awe, <laughs> as we stand in awe at the foot of the cross. We can't help but sense the reality that transcends that perilous moment in AD 31, that matchless space on Golgotha's hill, the beautiful yet ugly spectacle before our eyes reaches into the core of our heart and speaks of something more, something larger, something beyond our wildest imagination than that single event of history. As we gaze into that space and that time of Calvary, we come face to face with the very eternal heart of God. In that historic moment of Calvary, the heart of God declared, this is who I am. This is who I am. And I've always been and always will be. I am, he said to Moses in Exodus 34. I am the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving sin and iniquity, rebellion and wickedness. Somebody needs to know today that what happened at Calvary was a revelation of who God is. Calvary was simply the unfolding of the timeless identity of a timeless God. A God who loves and forgives before there was a Calvary. Did you get me? Yes. When sin rose up in Eden, there was an active Savior whose heart immediately began to bear the rebellion of man's, or the, the pain rather of man's rebellion. The Bible said in Revelation chapter 38, Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was God, as I said before, who went after Adam asking, where are you? And with his persevering heart of forgiveness, God moved into action even before Adam could ask for forgiveness. Adam didn't even know how to ask for forgiveness. And because he didn't even know how to do it, before he could do it, God didn't even tell him how to do it. God just knew that he needed forgiveness. And the Bible said, he killed the lamb, Jesus, and he closed them. He forgave them. Are you hearing me today? You see, somebody need to know that God is the moved by the blood of Jesus in order to love us. He loved us before Jesus shed his blood. Are you hearing me? He was not driven by the sacrifice.
eyes on Jesus in order to forgive us. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 4, 10, this is love. Not that we love him, are you hearing me? But that he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Oh, I could shout hallelujah. That I could run and I could dance and shout hallelujah to the son of God for loving me when nobody loved me. For loving me when I couldn't love myself. Oh, that somebody could get up in this place and shout hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the love of God. Are you hearing me today? The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. The song said it goes beyond the highest star and moves down to the lowest hell. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song. Ages come and go, nations perish, kingdoms collapse, and mountains crumble, seas retire, elements burn with fire. But hallelujah, but hallelujah, but uh, the love of God lives on forever. <laughs> Brennan Manning, I'm telling the story, you will go to lunch. <laughs> a noted author tells the story about an experience he had while he was at a woman's retreat, maybe something similar to this. He had conducted a variety of sessions that weekend. And he found that the women were very responsive. But there was one woman in particular who remained stone faced and unmoved, contributed nothing toward any of the sessions. And at the close of the session that weekend, he asked the group. Would any one of you like to share something special that happened to you this weekend? It was at this time that this withdrawn woman spoke. And she said, something wonderful happened to me last night. She said, when I went to bed, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was in a beautiful banquet hall. The women were all wearing lovely gowns and the men were dressed in formal attire. This, there was this one rather interested and intense man. And he came over and he asked me to dance with him. Yeah. Oh, that I could dance. Wow. Mm -hmm. And as we danced together, I realized it was Jesus. Do you say Jesus doesn't dance? Well, she had a dream. Yeah. Halfway through the dance, Jesus leaned over and whispered in my ear. He said, Catherine. I'm crazy about you. Oh, yeah. Then he hugged me and the dream was over. Oh, yeah. If there's one thing I want the woman to know today, when you leave here, if there's nobody else crazy about you. Jesus mm. is crazy about you. Mm. Jesus is crazy about you. The story of Hosea is God's story. The story of Gomer, it's my story. Hosea was crazy about God. Jesus is crazy about me. It's crazy about He's madly in love with you. And all he wants to do is save you. Mm. But you keep running, 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 prostituting yourself. When are you going to stop? He's coming after you. 
constant do is save us. He wants me to have a place in his eternal kingdom. That's all he wants, you know. But we are running as if he wants to kill us. The sad thing is we run to the one who wants to kill us. And we are in a relationship with the devil who is seeking only to kill us and to sweep us into hell. And all God wants to do is to save us. You were once baptized. But you acted the fool. You played the fool with your eternal salvation. Your eternal destiny. I just saw a young lady in the last picture of one who was here with you all last time. She's dead. One year later, she's dead. Who would have told her? I just attended a funeral about three weeks ago. He was a 30, promising, powerful young man. The place was packed. Everybody knew him. He actually had a letter from President Obama commending him for his work. 30 years old and I watched those parents buried their 30 year old son. Nobody could have told him that the day he died would have been his last day. Death doesn't bargain with you. He doesn't come and tell you when he's coming. When he comes, he comes. And you have no power over it. You have no choice. And you're sitting here. Playing the fool with your eternal destiny. All you gotta do. Young woman. Especially my young woman. Especially my young women. We are the ones of the intent. Not saying the older ones aren't. But we, the world has pulled us. We are attracted to the things of the world and what we can get out of it. The world isn't attracted to us. The world wants us and he wants to kill us. And all God wants to do is to save us. What is it? That is so important that you want to sacrifice your soul for. What is it? What is it that the devil has to give you right now in this world that is more than what God has prepared for you? Eternity with God? Is it not better than in hell with the devil? I'm appealing to somebody. You've been playing the fool. You've been brought up in the church. Maybe you came in after a while. Maybe you were just recently baptized. Maybe you're not yet baptized. But the day has come. Come, Pastor. But the time has come now. Is the day of salvation. The Bible said if you hear my voice. Pardon not your heart. Stand to your feet. <laughs>